have a warm Yeshua Ben David welcome to Dr. Jay Geisler. Thank you. I got the. Well, it's an honor to be here. I'm uh, Irish and uh, German, and uh, that's kind of my background. So the Irish side of me likes to tell stories. But I'll make sure that when I am quoting scripture, I will tell you, and I'll tell you when I'm telling you a story. So um, we're all living a story. I remember my daughter one time, she, uh, she, I went to read one of her papers, I don't know, third grade, and it says, you know, every life has a story, here's mine. I remember her starting, and I thought, what a, what a beautiful way to begin. You know, one of the things uh, working with Jeff is uh, rediscovering the Jewish roots of Christianity. And, you know, that's why, of course, you use the name Yeshua. And, you know, looking at the Hebrew Bible, what some people also refer to as the uh, Old Testament, but it's never really old, it's always new. That's why I prefer the term Hebrew Bible. And yet, at the same time, the New Testament or the, um, you know, teachings of the early Christian church is written in Greek. And so what we have uh, today is we have two worlds that came together. We have the uh, Jewish world and we have the, the Greco-Roman. The Romans uh, actually took over that uh, the Greek world. And that's, of course, why you had Pontius Pilate is the one that uh, sentenced Jesus to death. So you have two worlds coming together. So I'm going to tell a couple of stories. The first is the Oracle of the Delphi. You know, today when we talk about pagans, and we talk about, you know, reaching out to people, uh, Paul on the Areopagus, that's in, the, uh, in Greece, that's actually uh, there in Athens, it's, it's the hill where people would go up to, the Acropolis is there, and uh, that's where they would go to uh, debate, to share news, the marketplace, all these things. And, you know, when Paul went there, he introduced them to the unknown God. If you are familiar with that story, he said, I can see that you're a religious people. I can see that you are, are religious because you have all these uh, monuments and statues. But I noticed that you have a statue to an unknown God. This is right out of uh, Acts of the Apostle. And he says to them, well... Let me uh, introduce you to that unknown God, and his name is Jesus. Of course, he's using the Greek instead of uh, Yeshua, the Hebrew, or the Aramaic. He says, he introduces him to Jesus. And of course, the philosophers start arguing and that kind of stuff. But that's his introdu introduction there into, um, into Athens. Well, the story goes that what actually that unknown god, that statue that was there in Athens, that there was a wise man, that there was a plague, an epidemic, like today. And, you know, they didn't know anything about viruses or bacteria. They, they knew that uh, somehow they had angered the god. A lot of the uh, ancient world religions is on appeasing god, not about Emmanuel being with us, god being with us in our lives. It was like, appeasing God. How do we keep gods from being angry? And they went to this uh, wise man and said, we've offered sacrifice, you know. We've offered sacrifice to all the gods in this, this terrible epidemic. This plague is continuing. And they said, you know, what shall we do? And he, this wise man, said, well, you're obviously missing a god. And they said, well, what god is it? Well, I don't know. The god is unknown. Well, how do we sacrifice to this unknown God? And he said, well, you take a, a young lamb and you leave it go. And wherever it lays down, wherever it feels comfortable, because that's when uh, sheep lay down, you know, when they actually feel comfortable. He says, on that spot, you sacrifice that lamb. And that monument to the unknown God... Uh, goes back to that lamb. And of course, that unknown God is not unknown to us. It's the lamb that lay down its life. 
And so that's where that story comes from in Athens, that story of, you know, the unknown God. And that's who we today are still introducing to the world, this unknown God. Now, having said that, the wisest man in Greece was Socrates. The Oracle of the Delphi, this is a place where you had, just like, uh, so you're familiar, uh, the period of Jeremiah and, and the fall of Jerusalem is about the you know, golden age of Greece. So these two worlds, and there's even a story which I may share about Plato actually meeting Jeremiah. These two worlds uh, existed, the world of uh, Jerusalem and Israel and uh, the, the Greek world of, uh, of Athens and Socrates. So anyhow, this prophetess, uh, that's what it was, at the Oracle of Delphi said prophesies that Socrates is the greatest of men. Well, not actually the greatest, the wisest of men, key word there, the wisest of men. And when Socrates heard this, he said, this is not true. I am not the wisest of men. I know nothing. I don't know if any of you remember, uh, what was it, with uh, Hogan's Heroes? With, uh, remember, I know nothing. Sergeant Schultz, what did they ask them? That was how he kept from going on the Eastern Front. I know nothing. Well, that's what Socrates said. And he was... Um, angry about this. As a matter of fact, people kept coming back and said, the oracle says that you're the smartest man in all of Greece. So he made his way on a pilgrimage. He made his way on a pilgrimage there to Delphi. That's where the oracle was at. And when you go in to the temple above the lintel, that would be the place above the door you're familiar with, you know, the Passover story where they put blood on the lintel. That's like your entrance, you know, and and of course, in the Passover story, that protects uh, the people of, well, who would later be Israel at that time, they're the Hebrews, uh, from you know, the angel of death over Egypt. So as uh, Socrates is going in, over the lintel in Greek was know thyself. And in AA, for example, uh, to thy own self be true. You've probably heard this by, well, you know, uh, TV evangelists, you know, people telling self-help, know thyself, get to know who you are. And I mean, it's a very, very wise thing to do, to, to know who you are, you know, to know others. Well, it, it might be wise to know others, but to know yourself, that's enlightenment. That's the Holy Spirit there, knowing who you are, you know, created in the image and likeness of God. So anyhow, Socrates sees this, know thyself, and he goes into the oracle and he says to the oracle, you say that I am the smartest of men. I am the smartest of men. And I am not. I know nothing. I know nothing. And the oracle pauses and then turns to him and says, that is correct. Well, he says, well, then how could I be the wisest of men? I know nothing. He says, yes, the oracle says to him, yes, you know nothing, but you know that you know nothing. Everybody else thinks they know something and they know nothing. Therefore, you are the wisest of men. And I want to, <laughs> I want to say this to you because see, you know, if you looked at what happened the last week, I am so tired of listening to all kinds of people that think they actually have wisdom and know what's going on. Nobody, if you pay attention in my lifetime, nobody predicted that the Iron Curtain would collapse. There was nobody out saying that communism was on its last legs and was going to collapse. People looked at South Africa, right? People looked at South Africa and said, this is going to be a bloody riot. And then, of course, you know, have... Bishop Tutu, and you have Mandela, and, and there's this peaceful transition. You know, people don't call the stock market crashing, or all of a sudden there's a boom. Or, for example, in the midst of this, you know, COVID epidemic, not the 1%, but the 0.001%. That's one hundredth of 1%. Their net worth went up $1.5 trillion in the midst of this. 
So this idea that people actually know what's going to happen, people didn't know what was going to happen, everybody there at the Capitol. So let's start with that. And now I'm going to talk about a little bit about Jesus. I'm going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount, the fifth chapter. Jesus goes up to the mountain. Matthew, yes. Jesus goes up, the fifth chapter of Matthew. Uh, Luke has the Sermon on the Plain. He goes up to the fifth chapter. He goes up to the top of the mountain, sits down, and begins to teach his disciples. And the word disciples in Greek, by the way, is students. You know, we talk about being disciples. Well, it means to be a student. A student means that we're always open to learn more. That's why I started with this idea of, you know, Socrates being the wisest of men. If we think we have it all, if we think we know it all, if we think we have all the right news, if we think we have all the right truth, we're not open to learn because God is constantly teaching us. So if you look at the first beatitude, Jesus sits down, and that's the traditional way in the Mideast to teach is actually sitting. There's sitting, kind of almost a squat to that. So Jesus sits down and teaches his students. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The, the Gospel of Luke says, blessed are the poor. Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So what does that mean? When Jesus got up there to talk to these crowds, remember, they're not at the temple, they're not at the synagogue, they're actually at a field. And if you go over to Israel, you can see the place where they say the Beatitudes took place. And it's interesting, if you're, you know, actually there, it does seem like it's a plain, because that's what Luke says. He says it's the Sermon of the Plain. On the other hand, if you're down below, it actually looks like the Sermon on the Mount. So, question of perception. You know, maybe Jesus gave it multiple times. Maybe it's a perception of where they are. But you can go over to Israel and see this. So, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So, what does that mean? If we could translate it into Pittsburghese, and you know, that's really what evangelism is about. It's going back and seeing what it meant then, and then building a bridge. And as you know, Pittsburgh is a city of bridges. There's more bridges in the world, although occasionally Venice will argue about that. But those bridges are so tiny, I don't think they're real bridges. If they're not made out of steel, they're not real bridges in my mind. So I was a former steel worker at J&L Steel. So anyhow. We build a bridge from the ancient world, that is the, uh, you know, the Jewish world and the Greco-Roman world, and we bring it here today into Pittsburgh. And we talk into the language of the people. So, how do we say this? You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom. If you think that you don't have it together, if you think you could learn more, if you think you are broken, if you think you are wounded, if you actually have a degree of humility, you're blessed. He doesn't say, blessed are you who've got it all together, blessed are you who are there in the synagogue, blessed are you at the temple. He's talking to peasants primarily in a field and saying, if you are broken, you are blessed. You are blessed when you realize your brokenness. And by the way, St. Paul echoes this. What does he say? All have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. We are all broken. We all have clay feet. So how does the spiritual journey begin? By knowing our brokenness. By knowing our emptiness. Knowing that we are alienated from God. Some people refer to this as the Roman road. You know, Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So here is the wisest of the ancient philosophers, and he knows that with all the information, all the knowledge he has, he is still broken. For you out of the Catholic world, Thomas Aquinas was one of their greatest theologians. He wrote, and a lot of the Catholic teachings are based on that, at the very end of his life, he had a vision of Jesus, and he wrote several, you know, tombs. He could actually dictate to three different scribes at the same time and keep it together, kind of like a master chess person. And he had a, a vision of God, 
and he stopped writing and he said, and the Catholic Church has really based their theology on this, he said, all of my writings are but straw. He was the greatest medieval theologian, and in the end, after he came face to face, uh, what we call a beatific vision, a vision of, of God, he realized that all of his writings were just but straw. So the first step of the 12-step program is the first step of Christianity, admitting that we're broken, admitting that we're alienated from God, admitting that all have sinned. In the fall of Adam and Eve, all have fallen. And, you know, what does uh, St. Paul said? All of creation, this is in Romans, all of creation groans for redemption. And so, you know, people think about sin, and, you know, we talk about sin, and, you know, most of us are talking about our personal sins. You know, my sins are, you know, uh, rather boring. Uh, they're very repetitive. You know, if I could get rid of them, I would. You know, when I was young, I'd have some exciting sin. As I'm older, not too much, you know, it's pretty boring. I, I confess regularly, actually, to the rabbi on a regular basis. That's kind of how we end our meals, you know, our brokenness, our sins. But that is the beginning of looking for God, knowing that you are broken. In Greek, the word for sin, harmatia, uh, means to miss the mark. It was originally an archer shooting at a target, and you would miss the mark. Now, we, who have been influenced by the Protestant world, look at sin as my personal sin. But in Greek, that sin is greater. It's the sin of the brokenness. What do you think coronavirus, what do you think COVID-19 is? It is sin. It is the manifestation of a world that is alienated from God. Sin, disease, uh, hurricanes, natural disaster. Sin is not just my personal sin, but as Paul says, all of creation groans for redemption. So the first step of getting a realistic view of yourself and the world is to realize that even though we are created in the image and likeness of God, we have fallen. Because if you got it all together, why would you need a savior? You gotta be saved from something. And by the way, in Hebrew, if you look at the roots of that word, it means to be saved. It means to go home, like when you are rescued on a rescue operation, like when somebody is rescued in the desert, you know, and they say, well, what do you want to do? I want to go home and see my family. I want to go home and be with those that I love. Nobody says, well, now that I've been rescued from near death, I want to go to Walmart, <laughs> right? Although I have a rescue, a guy who actually is a professional rescuer, and I said that in my sermon, and he came up and said, well, I want to let you know, I actually did have one person that wanted to go to Walmart. <laughs> and I'm like shocked. He said, but he had very good reasons. He wanted to bring gifts for those who rescued him. So, so you know, unless we know we're broken, we can't be saved. And that's what that first step in the 12-step program we admitted we were powerless over our addiction, over alcohol, sin, lust, greed, you know, name it all, the seven deadly sins, pride, anger, you know, gluttony, lust, envy, sloth, right? You know, whatever, whatever brokenness. You know, we're all power. We all have something that we're powerless over. Sam Shoemaker, who was uh, an Episcopal priest who helped get AA started, said this, Everybody has a problem, is a problem, or they live with a problem. So, you know, that covers it. I was a Catholic priest down in uh, Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. And, you know, whatever is said in the confessional um, is confidential. Um, and you can never say anything that would link. But I want to let you know, there was a little Italian parish. And oftentimes I'd hear confession, and this is how they would start. Padre. Me have no sins, but my husband, <laughs> right? <laughs> the bottom line is we start by looking at ourselves. And that's what the first step is. That's what about falling short of the glory of God. 
Our friend Socrates, I don't want to leave him there in the Oracle of Delphi. So as he finds out that he's the wisest of men because he knows nothing and he knows that he knows it, on the way out, and a lot of people know this, you know, know thyself, be thyself, true to thyself, you know, to thy own self, be true. A lot of people, you'll hear a lot of pop psychologists say this, you need to, to know who me is, you need to find your inner child, all that stuff. That goes back to the ancient Greeks, know yourself, right? And as Christians, we know ourselves, and we also know that we're substantially broken. You know, we've fallen short of the glory of God. So anyhow, when Socrates is coming out, he looks at the lintel going out, and there's a different phrase, and this is really important for us today. You know what it says? It says, know thy times. It's not enough to know yourself, but you have to know that the time that you live in. And you can see that we as a country are under incredible stress right now. This was, whatever you think about it, what happened there with the counting of the votes and, you know, the whole electoral college and the protest, it shows that we are in troubled time. COVID-19 shows that we are in troubled times. The unemployment shows that we are in troubled times. And the fact that when so many people are struggling in the midst of it, the point, not 1%, the point, oh, oh, one hundredth of 1% increased their wealth $1.5 trillion. So we need to know ourselves, but we are living in troubled times. So when Socrates comes out, his student, of course, is Plato. He, like Jesus, didn't write anything. It was Plato that recorded all of his writings and sayings. Just like Jesus, the only thing that we know is he wrote in the sand, something that would not be permanent. It is his disciples who carry the message. So that brings us to the second beatitude. You know, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. When something bad happens, when someone dies, it is natural to mourn. And if we, as a country, admit that we are powerless and we are broken, and, uh, you know, the whole idea that, you know, and it's not, Trump wasn't the first, make America great again. I mean, I love it. Yes, I want America to be great again. But you know where that comes from? It doesn't come from Trump. It comes from a, a young French aristocrat named Alexis de Tocqueville. He came after the French Revolution, well, the American Revolution, and then the French Revolution, and he came to America, and he wanted to see what makes America tick. Why is this country taking off? And it was interesting. There were some things that really, really impressed him. One was, we love to volunteer. We love to start, like, get a few Americans together and we'll start a nonprofit. That's the way we work. We've done it back to Granges, free libraries, you know, uh, you know, most of Europe does not have, you know, volunteer fire departments. Americans love to volunteer. Our country, like, it's not just what money we make, you know, the whole, you know, gross national product, but the productivity of the American people, not just in the economy, but what we do in charity. You know, we feed. We heal the hospitals, most of our hospitals, most of our universities actually had Christian origins. You know, University of Pittsburgh, Harvard, Princeton. You know, look at this area here, Bethany, you can just name the school. Look at our universities. So when we're looking at this, he was so impressed that Americans volunteer. A second thing that really impressed him was the productivity, believe it or not, of the women of the country. Over in Europe, the educated women were sitting around in salons gossiping and talking about philosophy. Over here, the women were in the frontier and they were as much 
as a partner as the man. They were doing as much work, and he just was just impressed with how industrious American women were. But the third thing is, and this is his quote, why is America great? America is great because she is good. When she ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Do you hear that? You cannot be great without being good because it is God who chooses to humble us or to lift us up. It's, it's Miriam, you know, the song of Mary, you know, where she says the Magnificat, you know, you have brought down the powerful from their thrones and you have lifted up, you've lifted up the lowly. You've taken me a servant girl and raised me up. And so that's why America can only be great when she is good. That's why we always need to go back to our roots. At my church, we have the gospel, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, you know, we have like the nice, you know, it's very Episcopalian kind of thing, you know. They got it in a nice gold, you know. I mean, I think sometimes people make books really good so nobody ever actually opens them and looks at them rather than the, you know, the worn Bible. Like my, my wife, we sent her Bible to be, you know, to be recovered. She's used it. She, she was like in college and it just completely is worn out. It's going to cost more to have it recovered than it is than she actually go out and buy a new one. But she has marked it. She has read it. She has, you know, inwardly digested it. So you see, you know, that's what the book's supposed to be. Well, anyhow, we have the Bible and it sits on a pillow and it says, ad fontes, to the fountain or to the source. During the Protestant Reformation, this is what the echo was. Don't listen to what the Catholic Church is saying. Go and see what the Bible says. Is it true? So constantly we go back to the source. And of course, the source for us is the Holy Scripture. And so we're constantly going back. There's all kind of people who have opinions. There's all kind of people who tell us them. When I hear people saying, I say, well, tell me, what's the source for this? You know, like, you know, one of the ones that, you know, what is the, the one, God helps them who helps himself? That's nowhere in Scripture. <laughs> God helps those that can't help himself, because if you can help yourself, go do it. Who needs God, right? When you can't do it for yourself, when you're broken and wounded, that's when God, what does it say? It says, when we were powerless and still in our sin, in Paul's writings in Ephesians, when we were powerless in our sin, Christ died for us. You know, when we were broken on the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. We weren't even aware of our own brokenness. So, you know, this is... The second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn. We need to mourn for our country. We need to bless and lift up and mourn all those who've died, not just of COVID-19 in Allegheny County, but I want to let you know, up until December, there was 800 overdose deaths. It was running neck to neck with COVID. And look at all the money and resources. And many of the people who died were 60, 70, 80 years old. Many of the young people who died were 20, 30, 40 years old. And until just recently, it looked like the overdose deaths may actually be beyond COVID-19. And this epidemic, I want to let you know, is man-made. They've traced it back to the pharmaceutical companies. They've traced it. And by the way, nobody's going to jail. There'll be some money that they'll pay out of the money that they made, 75% of all heroin addicts, you know where they come from? Through the medicine cabinet. Through the medicine cabinet. So blessed are those who mourn. We need to mourn. Whatever happened this week, however people look at it, and I hear people on the right, but I can tell you this, you have a country that's at war with itself. You have a country that is deeply disturbed, and we should mourn. We should mourn, you know, we should admit we are powerless and we're broken, and we should mourn. 
The third beatitude, blessed are the meek, the humble, for they shall inherit the face of the earth. And what is the ultimate? After the first, you know your first step, you know your brokenness. The first beatitude, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Then the second is, blessed are those who mourn. We should mourn. We should mourn our own brokenness. We should mourn the brokenness of our country, brokenness of our system, our economic system. That when people are struggling, the people at the, not 1%, but 1 one hundredth of percent, would increase their wealth $1.5 trillion. Why do you think Bezos became the richest man in the world? Because we are all ordering from Amazon because nobody could go out. Or Tesla. There's something wrong with the society where during an epidemic, the rich prosper. It's also the same thing that happens in war. The poor die, the rich become wealthy. We need to mourn a system like this that rewards this. You know, what they ought to do is when somebody gets a billion dollars, we should have a national, like, everybody gathers together, and we celebrate them that they have made a billion dollars, and we give them a medal and a trophy and say, okay, now the rest of your money's going, we're going to just distribute it to everybody else, because you could never spend a billion dollars in your life. So you have reached the pinnacle that you don't need, like they asked, they asked Rockefeller, uh, who was the richest man in the world, you know, have, do you have enough millions? And this is when a million was a billion, right? And so... When will you have enough millions? And you know what he said? After the next one. Right? Now there's a race to see who, whether it would be Elon Musk of Tesla or it would be Bezos, will be the first trillionaire. First trillionaire. By the way, I remember when the U.S. government, the whole budget wasn't a trillion dollars. Now we're talking about one person. So, the third beatitude, blessed are the humble, the meek. You know... You know, it's interesting how humble Jesus is when you look at Yeshua and you look how he travels about. You know, any of you ever see that T-shirt, it's hard to be great when you're humble, or no, it's hard to be humble when you're great. Have any of you seen that? Well, evidently, it's easy to be humble when you're God. Because if you read Jesus, if you actually take the Gospel of Mark and read it from beginning to end, you will be marked by the humility of Jesus. You know, that Yeshua is not doing signs and wonders to impress the crowds. He's doing it in a response to their faith. And even after he's healed them, he doesn't say, look what I did. He said, your faith has made you well. See, the humility of God. I mean, that's what really made my conversion when I read. It's like, this just got to be true because it just doesn't make any sense. Like, God walked amongst us and was humble. You know, born in a manger, born in poverty. You know, worked with his hands. You know, was homeless, right? He said, birds of the air have their nest and foxes have their lair. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You know, it wasn't for the, uh, the uh, you know, Jewish Women's Auxiliary League. None of those men would have been financed, by the way. Did you ever notice that? None of them have a job. They all quit, you know. But, uh, you know, who's funding them? It's the, uh, the Jewish women around them. And they're his disciples also. We know that. And uh, we even know that Cleopas, that one of them was actually uh, related to Herod's treasure. It's nice to think that maybe some of the government funding found its way into Jesus. I'm sure he'd do better with it than Herod would. So, turning our life over to God. And by the way, when I'm working with people of mental illness and addiction, I just want to say this to you. Some of them really can't, you know, hold, you know, like the 12 steps. We admitted we were powerless over our addiction, our life's domain. Two, we came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, we made a decision to turn our will and life over to care of God. And this is how I teach it to people who are mentally ill, but this is also how I teach it to, you know, people in the church, because we're mentally ill, because we believe in something you cannot actually see. Do you know the psychiatrists, when they look at us, and they look at Jeff, and they look at me, and they look at you, they would say we're insane, because we are delusional. We believe in something we cannot see, we cannot touch, we cannot hear. That, my friends, is a definition of schizophrenia, right? And as we have more and more atheists 
in the medical profile, you will see that religion will actually become some form of delusion or mental illness, right? I'm not kidding about this. I mean, yeah, I've met some people and it's, oh, you're, you believe. Like, how quaint. Uh, I, you know, I had a grandmother that believed or something. <laughs> like, you know, if, if you really were into science, if you really were into to life, you'd like, well, you know, give away this delusion. Remember how St. Paul said when I was a... When I was a boy, you know, I played like a boy. When I was a man, I had to put it. Well, they're kind of like referring to us now, saying like, isn't it time to put away like, you know, Christmas and like, you know, and put away, you know, the whole idea of uh, the Passover and Jesus and that, you know, these really should go in the place like, you know, <clears throat> like uh, the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus and, you know, the Great Pumpkin. Like, you know, that's great, delusional. But I'm telling you that that's, as you get more and more into a secular world, they'll look at us as we're the ones who are mentally ill. So, the third, this is how I make it, and by the way, if you want to evangelize, keep this in mind. And this is how I teach uh, what sometimes is referred to as a Roman road. Uh, this is classic evangelism. Um, all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen. That's, that's the Roman road. I mean, you don't need a savior unless you're lost, right? Second, you know, what is it? Jesus died for your sins, right? Jesus died for your sin. And then what is it? Billy Graham, make a decision, right? You know, I've been down there with, um, with Rabbi, down there to Billy Graham. What is it? What, I mean, like, you know, if you ever went to Billy Graham, and at the very end, Billy Graham says, okay, he's preached, you know, he's got everybody fired up. Okay, now everybody go home and think about this for a few days. What does he do at the end of every crusade? Come up, come up. And do you know why? Because he goes back to Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday, somebody that Billy Sunday reached out, you know, and Billy Sunday had actually uh, evangelized, right? that when Billy Sunday had evangelized, you go back there, right? And you find an evangelist before him, an evangelist before him. And um, the great evangelist, Dwight L. Moody, he was converted by a shoe salesman. And Dwight L. Moody was a great preacher of his day, and you have Dwight L. Moody, and then you have Billy Sunday, and eventually you get to Billy Graham, right? Well, anyhow, Dwight L. Moody is giving one of these, like, open air, like, you know, come to the Lord, and he's doing a series of preaching, and he says, you know, come back tomorrow, you know, think of what I said, be ready to make a decision for Christ, you know, he says, come back, you know, because it's a series, and guess what happens as people are going out, and he hasn't made a decision. They hear the bells of Chicago, the fire alarms, it's the great fire of Chicago, and Dwight L. Moody vowed that he would ever preach. He would never leave the pulpit without asking people to make a decision. Now, because Titus and Timothy say this is the day of your salvation, right? Make it now because he realized some of those people hadn't made a decision for Christ and they would be consumed by the Chicago fire. And so that's why Billy Graham always ends with making a decision. So this is the way that I teach it. Real simple, and I want you to repeat after me, because you know this, ABC. Can you say that? ABC, ABC ready? Admit, Admit, right? What are we admitting? Any, what are we admitting? <laughs> By the way, when somebody admits something, you know what's occurred? A crime. <laughs> and guess what? We've committed crimes. Guess who they're against? The creator, right? That's what we call sin. What are we admitting? We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. All right. B. Believe, right? Believe. Believe that Christ Jesus, you know, died for your sins, right? And then what's C? Commit. 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 You need to make a commitment. And this is the way we actually did it, like I did it on the psych wing at St. Francis when it was open. We'd do it as a little rap. One, two, three, A, B, C. Admit, believe, commit, right? And I did this with people who couldn't, like, tell you what day it was, had difficulty, 
you know, tying their shoes, but they could remember the ABCs. Admit, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Believe that Christ Jesus died for our sins. Commit ourselves to what? Christ, his cross, because he says, hey, you know, you know, I know a lot of TV evangelists who get up there and say, I've got a success plan for you. This is what God has for you. Maybe, maybe not. But the Lutherans, I attended a Lutheran seminary. I've been at a Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, and Catholic seminary. And you know what I do? It's like I'm always looking for the common stuff. I put some things on the shelf. But let me tell you the thing the Lutheran said to me. Do not ask if God has a success plan for you. But rather ask, do I look good on wood? Because you cannot get rid of the cross, the brokenness of Christ. He lays himself down for us. He sacrifices. He is the lamb to be slain. So the first three beatitudes and the first three steps. You know, I'll, you know Jesus went to the top of the mountain, sat down, teaches us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We admitted we are powerless and our life's unmanageable. Okay? Second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Now you say, that doesn't sound like too much of mourning. It does. Because when we're working with people, they're admitting they're powerless over addiction. Their life's unmanageable. And it says, second step, we came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. If you are going to be restored to sanity, and by the way, in Latin, anytime you see RE, it means to do over. Replay, rerun, reuse, Right? So if we're going to be restored to sanity, what is, well, and maybe we should say this for America, right? Like, what is our current state in America? We are insane. We are crazy. Look at, we're fighting amongst ourselves. Satan loves that. You know, divide the Christians, divide the believers, have them fighting amongst themselves. Have them fighting amongst themselves. So, third you know, what is it? Blessed are the meek, the humble, for they shall inherit the face of earth. What is it? We make that decision. Third step, made a decision to turn our will and life over to care of God. And it's not just a decision. And I want to let you know, I know the evangelical world. I've been to the Billy Graham School of Evangelism twice. They're big on the commitment, right? You know, making the decision, making the decision. But I want to let you know, decision without action is just like, well, I'm going to like make a New Year's resolution, right? Everybody makes them, but how many actually follow through? And by the way, the rest of the 12 steps, and I'll kind of end here with that. The, the rest of the 12 steps are discipleship. You know, teaching you to look at yourself. In the fourth and fifth step um, in the 12 step program is you take a look at yourself. You look at the good, the bad, and the ugly, like a good Clint Eastwood movie, right? Because all of us have good. All of us have bad, and all of us, we don't like to admit it, but you look deep enough, you know, sometimes you have to look under the bed, you know, it's kind of scary, but guess what's there? Some ugly. We all have ugly in our life. Lost our temper, kicked the dog, it, you know, it could be anything, you know, you know, broke someone's truck, whatever. But the bottom line is we all have that, right? And then we share it with another human being. Well, yes, God knows this stuff, but you know what? When I share with Rabbi Kip, when I confess to him, it is humbling. That's why we do it. Not because God doesn't forgive. God always forgives. God's always taken the first step. But it's our humility. You know, James says, confess your sins to one another. You know, why? Because it's your opportunity to get humble, get real. Why do you think 12-step groups and support groups? Because people have found that they can share their brokenness, their hurt, not just, you know, I mean, I've been to some churches, and this does not seem to be that, but I've been to some churches where it looks like everybody's plastic. How are you? The kids are fine. We're fine. Everybody's fine. Everybody's fine. Nobody comes in and says, oh, my God, I could barely make it through this week. It was terrible, right? Sometimes that is, you know, that is reality. After we take an inventory of ourselves and share it, then we look at our character defects. If you take a look at yourself, you'll know what your, you know, you'll know what your weaknesses are. You'll know what, well, you know, they have a 12-step uh, support group now for rabbis, 
for ministers and priests. Maybe some of you have heard it. It's called On and On and On, right? <laughs> Admit your shortcomings, right? On and on and on. Or I don't know if you heard about the little kid who goes to the, the service in, uh, you know, an Episcopal church and, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the priest comes out and says, the Lord be, what is he doing? Oh, he's greeting us in the name of the Lord. Okay. And then they, they start, uh, you know, reading. Short. What's a, that's the word of God. We're listening to it. Uh, and then they proceed. They hold the gospel up, you know, because they're elevating. These are the words of Jesus, the very words of Jesus. You know, well, what, what are they doing now? Oh, they're going to read the words of Jesus. And then finally he gets up to the pulpit and he carefully takes his watch off and sets it down so that he can look at it. And the uh, little kid says to his father, what's he doing now? What does that mean? Absolutely nothing, son. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so anyhow, I just wanted to um, introduce you to the first three steps. And I want to let you know, I'll, I'll just kind of end with this. When I walk around, I'm living in one of the recovery houses. So it's not something that we just... Um, uh, you know, kind of do theoretically. I mean, I'm in there, you know. Uh, I, somebody said, well, how, where are you staying tonight? I said, I'm a priest. I like to sleep around. I go to, <laughs> I'm in one three-quarter way because they're pretty insane, right? So I go, I have, I have a, a, a room that is a double room. And the sickest person, that's usually somebody coming out of the psych wing or somebody coming, that's the room I stay in until they're stable. Then I move to another room and stuff. But I want to let you know, when I walk around those houses, you ever see that film, The Sixth, uh, Sixth Sense, where the little kid says, I see dead people? I want to let you know, when I walk around, I see dead people. <laughs> I mean, I literally see dead people. I've, I've, I'm there today, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, in the bathroom, and, well, this guy made that. Now, he's still alive. I go to the shower downstairs. Oh, yeah, that guy's dead. I go out to the, uh, to the, the yard, and we put, a, a, you know, another... Uh, parking space in. Oh, yeah, he's in prison. Um, oh, yeah, the guy who put the Christmas lights up last year, yeah, he's dead. I mean, literally, it's life and death out there. Um, and uh, we had uh, two people that I sponsored uh, OD'd and died this year who lived in that house at one point. They weren't living in it. They usually leave before they get into that behavior. We have, by the grace of God, only had one woman die in one of our houses, and uh, somebody thought they heard something, and and, uh, oh, that probably wasn't, and, they, and she'd, over, you know, shot up in the bathroom, and, and we couldn't get to her in time. We keep Narcan around on a regular basis. We all know how to do it. We've done it in multiple houses where somebody has OD'd and that. But anyhow, so, yes, I see dead people, but I want to tell you about what God uh, can do, and I'll end with this guy. This guy's name's Mike. Last name, we'll just say P, Mike P. Mike came to us, and he had been a painter. And he was a successful, and this is, this is a heroin addict for you. I just want to give you, uh, to show you how it happened. He was a successful painter, very successful. Had his own company, wife, kids, whole thing. Got injured on the job, fell off a ladder. So guess what happens? Goes to the doctor. What do they give him? Opioids, right? And I want to let you know, once you go over three days of opioids, the risk of addiction is there. And... At that time, it's like pain is what they say it is. And like doctors were given 30-day scripts. At the end of 30 days, if you do you know, an opioid, you will be addicted. And they need to have a protocol to taper them down. Oftentimes, because now they're getting nervous that this person's come back for two or three scripts and that the, uh, the uh, Federal Drug Administration will be after them, they cut them off. And so now you've got somebody going through this drug and somebody says, oh, I can get you something. And pretty soon, they head off in the path that ends up with heroin. So he ended up with heroin. His wife ended up actually relapsing, lost his business, lost his job, uh, was still painting, but was putting most of it in his arms. So he came to us four years ago. And we started to meet with him, just like we're talking here. And we ran him through the steps, you know, admitting we're broken, you know, believing that we can, you know, get clean, the power, power grade in yourself. The power grade in yourself, folks, this is, goes back to, the unknown God. You're getting him in the direction. The problem with knowing thyself is we need to know we're broken. But knowing there are times is this. We're not in the Jewish, you know, Greco-Roman world where everybody believed in God. 
the Jewish people believed in one God, they had a problem with this Trinity concept, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the problem wasn't God, it was how Christians looked at God. The, the Greco-Roman world, they had multiple gods. Well, you guys aren't in diversity. Why would you only want one God? You should be, you see what I'm saying? But that's not the world we live. We live in a world where people don't have God. And so we have to get them praying. We have to start them on a spiritual path. You can't bring somebody to Jesus unless they have some concept of God. So that's really what I am, a proto-evangelist. I'm getting them praying. I'm getting, so anyhow, we pray with them. We say the serenity prayer. If you want to be helpful to people in the 12-step program, learn the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can. And that's like saying the Shema here. This says you're in. You know, Shema, Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Akkad, right? Adonai, right? You know, when you say it, when you say it, you're part of it, right? And if you could chant it, yeah, man, you'll be a rabbi, right? You know, but when you can say this already, so when we're working with addicts at my church and we go to pray, we don't launch off into long... We say the serenity prayer, and all of a sudden, they just feel more comfortable. So that's the secret sauce. So anyway, let me tell you about a friend Mike, and we'll end with this. What happens with Mike is that he eventually changes, and he gets a job working, you know, because he's now, you know, in his 50s and getting up on ladders and stuff, and he gets a job working in a factory, actually a foundry. And uh, for the first time, he gets health insurance, you know, because he was privately employed, didn't have an, in, his own insurance and that kind of stuff. And... Um, and then what happens is he's now introduced to a 401k. So he comes to me and says, you know, how does this thing work? I say, find out what the match is. So I help him. He says, well, you know, I'd like to own a house someday. Okay, let's get on to Credit Karma and, like, find out what the bad news is, you know. And, you know, I mean, if they had negative numbers for, you know, <clears throat> your credit worthiness, some of these people would make it. But anyhow, I worked with him over a couple of years. We met every Tuesday. We had breakfast together and that. And so, um, in the end, he kept the job, saved up 20000 Why? Because he's not putting it in his arm. And praise God, in early January, he closed on a $150,000 house in Whitehall, Baldwin, Baldwin Whitehall, right? <laughs> he celebrated four years off of drugs. And he, he thanked Gus and, and uh, myself, but it's really God. You know, God's just using us. We're just, you know, the prayer of St. Francis, make me an instrument. But, you know, here's what he said. This is how far he came. He said, four years ago, when I went into Whitehall, Baldwin Whitehall, that's the school district. It's really near St. Peter's. He said, when I would go in there, the police would pick me up when I just came into the community. For no particular reason, my reputation was so bad as a drug addict, when they would see me, they would just put me in the car and save me the time and take me to the end of the... He said, now, four years later, I'm a productive, responsible member of society. Amen. You know? Amen. Amen. How did he become great? Because he became good. How will America become great again? We have to become good. Without the goodness, we cannot be great. So in the end, you know, where do we start that journey to greatness? Well, we start it in goodness. And where do we start goodness? Humbly on our knees. Same like